That's, that's inspiring. I'm, by the way, I'm also an insect eater. I love insects. They're very delicious. So for I think I have not introduced myself. I'm Jeff Van Acker. I'm a chief engagement officer at the Association for Vertical Farming. And I'm from Belgium. And our next speaker is from Belgium. Yes, in Belgium, he's actually one of uh, very famous. Uh, if you talk about mushrooms in Belgium, you always talk about mycelia, mycelia, mycelia. And I actually underestimated how famous mycelia actually is. When I read Paul Stamets book, Paul Stamets like the Dixon Despome from mushroom, from mushrooms. And uh, he's also famous for his TEDx talk, TEDx talk, Six Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World. So definitely watch that if you haven't. But in his book, he features, if you go to Europe, buy your spawn with mycelia. So we are very honored to have Casper Moreau from Mycelia on our stage to talk about mushroom farming. Give a warm welcome to Casper. To Thanks. I'm online. Good morning, still morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Casper, as it says here. I'm from uh, Mycelia, which is a mushroom spawn company. Mushroom spawn is actually the first phase of mushroom production. So we start with growing fungus, a fungus, a mycelium, on a, green, a grain or a seed, usually. That is used to put inside a larger volume of substrate or compost, which is then incubated, so as it says, until it's fully white or mature. And when it's mature, this is usually sold to producers of mushroom, which then produce mushrooms on this, and the waste is then afterwards discarded. So that's, in a nutshell, the production of mushrooms. And we're at the first step of the ladder. So, who are we? We're producers of mushroom spawn. We also have a mycelia school, which actually means that we train people to do what we do, also to make substrates and to produ produce mushrooms. We try to do that in an innovative and in an inspiring way to, in order to make the world a better place and not to prey on it. We have a private R&D, so research and development laboratory, so we invest a lot of our time and energy, energy in research and development of new things, of new applications, and myself, this is my job, uh, so I manage this part of our facility. So researching new possibilities for the mushroom industry. We also produce breathing bags and breathing boxes, which are actually plastic containers, which are used specifically for our industry, but also in the in vitro industry. So plants as well are grown in these boxes. We design filters that we integrate in these plastic containers, and then we put materials inside so they can breathe properly inside these containers as if they were outside. So we're trying to mimic nature. We've heard that before today. Mushrooms. Very simply put, a mushroom is the fruiting body of the underground network, which is called mycelium. So when I'm talking about mycelium, I'm talking about everything except for the mushrooms. And the mushrooms is usually the stuff that we eat. Fungi have a very specific role in nature. So together with bacteria that break down all the, the, the waste products of the plant industry, for example, are broken down by fungi and bacteria. So they're degraders. They actually transform organic matter back into inorganic matter, which is then reused by plants. So they're recyclers of nature. But the industry is not that straightforward. We cannot use every raw material just to grow mushrooms. So we use horse manure, straw, sawdust, etc. These are not always waste products, but that's what we use for making the mushrooms. But prime raw materials such as grains, seeds, and peat are the most abundantly used ones. So there's still a lot of work to do before we can actually go and uh, use our second-hand cardboard and grow all kinds of mushrooms on that. We're still quite a fair end from that. It is being done today, but not on the largest scale. So generally about mushrooms. Mushrooms are really good for us. They're really good for us in many, many ways. They're tasty, they're nutritious, really balanced. They're not that full of protein as some people tend to say, but they are really good for you. So the health benefits are enormous. 
They are recyclers of nature and they produce CO2 in abundant amounts. So really interesting for the people here. And uh, finally, even the industry as it is today is not really enormously damaging. It is, of course, there's, there's a lot of progression that we can make, but it's not as damaging as some other sectors are. So we are actually using a lot of waste and we're transforming it into something usable. But in vertical farming, what could we do with mushrooms? Like, you can't just do as if, as if we can't just integrate it very simply. Uh, the tasty and balanced nutrition, so let's take those out and transform that into the food products. So we can actually use it in cities to make the food products. But recycling, I can't really see how yet. I might be overlooking some things, but I, until now, until today, I haven't seen many projects yet that are using city waste and transform it into food. I have seen a lot of coffee grinds being made into mushrooms, etc., but not really a really big showcase where it's proved to be sustainable for a long period of time and in a good way. So we're still looking at a lot of challenges in that sector domain. But many, many species are being cultivated. Oysters, Conodermas, Hericium, Lutilana, Agrociba, Agarita, but the most important, of course, remains the white button mushroom. It's definitely the most grown mushroom in the world. And that's because it's not only tasty and great, but it's also not too hard to produce because there is a good system. But as you can see, mushrooms are grown in many, many ways, shapes and forms. In bags, on logs, vertical, horizontal, in bottles, on racks, shelves, in tunnels. Uh, many of these pictures have come from my mother. She's been in the business for 35 years. She has been in amazing places. You can't imagine where they grow mushrooms. Tunnels, houses, basements bags, bottles, hanging, standing. There's a lot of possibilities. But that's the idea that many people have, of course. Takes the horse dung, mix it into a nice uh, substrate, and then with these practical manuals, you can make your own compost at home. But that, of course, is not our reality. The reality is that the industry is really large scale that it is using enormous amounts of raw materials and energy and that the farmers are usually using very high-tech systems as in most industries today, of course. So our mushrooms come from large farms, they come from high-tech farms. So how could we actually integrate this kind of high-tech application, which is quite vertical already because we grow in beds, how can we integrate that into vertical farming as it is today? It is high-tech, it's a standard production system and it has a few really large drawbacks. The industry of mushrooms has to be large-scale, has to be high-tech because it's a difficult industry. Mushroom growing is not as simple as it is often portrayed, it's quite a high-tech thing to do. It is not simple, has never been simple and will probably never be simple, so there's still quite a few challenges to overcome before we can really simply integrate this into the vertical farming. But I do believe it's possible, certainly with white button mushroom, because the whole system actually exists. It's a fully operational system which uses waste products, which then grows it into mushrooms and then produces another waste produ product which can be used again as a raw material. So it actually could be a closed loop system. And as a, another benefit, it produces a lot of CO2, which then can be reused, uh, reused by plants. Now, a similar thing for Pleurotus, oyster mushrooms, that completely different thing, uh, they grow much faster, so they can actually sometimes be produced um, without compost, but just with a little bit of heat, you can make a substrate um, edible for these mushrooms, and then you can grow them. For example, as we see now, emerging trends, uh, on the waste, such as coffee grinds, uh, cardboards, etc. It is possible, it's definitely possible, it's a good showcase, but until now, it still faces a lot of difficulties because mushroom growing is hard. So, how is it done in real life then? In real life, they just buy lots of raw materials, for example, straw, which is not always a waste product, but they buy this, chop it up, then uh, ferment it, 
put it into huge tunnels for pasteurizing, then mix it with what we make, like spawn, mix it in with spawn, make it grow, push it into blocks, and then have it incubate. Incubation um, often faces a lot of problems, and this is one of the main things that we face today. It often you get other molds preying on our on the, 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 mold, the molds that we want to grow, they prey on it. Um, so other infections like bacteria also crop up. But if you're good, you've got nice substrates. And if you cut them and induce the fruits, you get beautiful mushrooms growing there. So you like just crunch them up. Lovely, lovely food. Straight from the bale, they taste better than anything you've ever had. Well, except for insects, perhaps. So could oyster mushroom perhaps provide some real good thing for vertical farming? Again, it is really difficult. There's a lot of, a lot of investments to be made. Um, the market's quite saturated. And also, just like with button mushrooms, I haven't said this before, but mushrooms grow really fast. You get a substrate, you put it in your growing room, like a fully incubated substrate, a white, nice block of substrate. Put it in your growing room, start to grow the mushrooms. And it'll take you like two, three, four weeks, and then the block is exhausted. So you have to take it out. So the turnover, the time that you can keep your raw material is very short. You take your material in, grow it, chuck it out again. It goes very fast. So um, again, quite a few challenges, but it can be done. And then the last showcase I want to show you is how lignicolous mushrooms grow. But then there's no like one system. There's probably a hundred trillion systems. Everyone's designed his own system. With agaricus, there is more or less a system. There's the Dutch system, which has been developed for over a long time. It was a great system, works very well. But with lignicolous mushrooms, and lignicolous, with this I mean everything that grows on wood. So most mushrooms that we call exotic, special, the ones that in China are the most normal mushrooms, they are actually called lignicolous mushrooms because they eat wood. Now, these are made in farms as well, for example. They could be made on, on sawdust, wood chips, bran, but many other things. But usually they are heat treated up to a certain degree. So you need quite specialized equipment as well. You need a steam generator, an autoclave, all sorts of machines. And with these machines you can sterilize the bags, then you inoculate the bags, you put the spawn in, then this grows. So you see them growing on the, le on the left until they're fully grown, and then when they're grown, you can grow mushrooms on them. Seems very simple, but it's not, that, it's not really that simple. You can have them in large hanging blocks, small hanging blocks, towers and caves. So lots of possibilities. Easy to grow them on logs, so in the Far East. They're grown like this extensively outside. So there are actually quite a few possibilities with these. I'm not even going in detail because there's a lot of more systems and ways to, 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 to grow these mushrooms. There's a lot of species and there's a lot of applications. So with all these techniques and possibilities, there might be some way that the production of lignicolous mushrooms could be integrated in vertical farming as well. But again, many challenges still remain. So this is actually the end of my PowerPoint, but the thing that really intrigues me, because I've learned so much yet already from the speakers that passed here today, like there's a lot of things happening, and I saw this rooftop farm in The Hague, that was really inspiring. So you could actually really combine that with the existing mushroom industry that, that is here today. Like there are representatives around in this room, and you could talk to them today. For example, the white button industry is really well set up. It's, uh, it's fully known. That's, there's a lot of known factors in there. So it could be integrated into vertical farm uh, because they are, their output is of CO2. So if you could manage to, to use the air and the CO2 that the white buttons produce, pump it into a room where the plants need the CO2 and then put the air back so the, the oxygen goes back to the mushrooms. You get a closed loop of, of air volumes. You'd have to filter it, and maybe it couldn't be done as easily as I think it, but I could foresee a really interesting and easy-going 
interchange there. Like it could really be done. So I've been inspired already today and I hope that you guys be inspired as well. It's a beautiful industry, the mushroom business is. It's not easy and we have to rely on what we already know because there's a lot of things known, but it is definitely possible to integrate it. Thanks a lot and see you soon in the panel.